Hello and welcome. I'm Daughter of Darkness. What can be more normal than getting in your car and driving somewhere? We do it every day and rarely think about it. That is, until someone or something takes an everyday activity and turns it into a nightmare. Those are the stories we'll be dealing with tonight. But before we do, let me remind you to join me right here every Thursday at 5 p.m. Central for the Party of Darkness, where I share new stories with you every week. So, sit back, relax, let me lead the way, and let's get scared together, 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 together. I've never heard anyone talk about this seriously, but living in a small town seems to make people cruel. Maybe it's just the sheer boredom that brings out the worst in people. I grew up in a rural Texas town with a crippling meth problem. There were no positive outlets or activities for people, like a movie theater or park. We didn't even have a large store for kids to just hang out in. The teens mostly just ended up drinking, driving, and going to bonfires. But quite a few of the teenage boys in my neighborhood decided that being evil was the best way to have fun. They would literally go out of their way while driving to swerve and try to scare younger kids riding bikes, or even poison dogs, just for the fun of it. They even set fire to a few of the trailer homes in my neighborhood, while people were still in them. Only one arrest was ever made in connection to those arsons, but it had definitely been a group activity. My neighborhood was a trailer park in which each trailer had a plot of land with a few acres of land and forest around the property. The road was gravel and that's what I had to learn to ride a bike on. It was difficult. One day, when I was around 10, I was doing my best to ride my bike on this road without falling when I saw my older sister who was about 16 at the time, sprinting along the side of the road towards me. I was going very slowly, trying to keep my balance, but I decided to just get off my bike when I noticed how panic-stricken my sister looked. I saw a dust cloud coming down the road a ways, indicating that a vehicle was coming towards us from over the hill. When my sister got to me, she grabbed me by the arm so hard I winced in pain, and she pulled me away from my bike. By this time, the vehicle had come over the hill, and I saw it was a truck, but it was still far enough away that I don't think they saw us. There were woods on either side of the road, and my sister pulled me into the woods on the left side as I asked her what was happening. She just told me to hurry. We made it about 30 feet into the woods when my sister dropped to the ground and pulled me down with her. She covered my mouth with her hand and told me to just be quiet. I complied. I saw that the vehicle she was so worried about was a black truck filled with five guys in their late teens and very early twenties. The truck screeched to a halt right where my bike had fallen. I froze in fear as my sister whispered a worried, shit, under her breath. Three of the guys got out of the truck. It was clear they were looking very intently into the woods on either side of the road. Luckily, for some reason, they all lined up and started walking to the woods on the opposite side of the road from where we were. They were talking, but we couldn't make out what they were saying. I was worried that they would take their time looking for us, since only a handful of people lived this far down the road, and it could have taken hours before another car would pass through. Luckily, fate intervened, and it only took about five minutes before another car did. One of the guys had already placed my bike in the back of the truck when they noticed the other car coming over the hill. They all quickly jumped back into the truck and sped off. We waited there in the woods, probably ten more minutes, before we finally stood up and started walking back home, although we did walk along the tree line instead of the road itself, just in case. My sister didn't say much to me, but she told my mom when we got home, that one of the boys that she had been hanging around that day 
was talking about wanting to kill some of the, quote, annoying kids in the neighborhood, unquote. And she assumed that it was a good bet that one or more of these annoying kids might end up being me or my brothers. It could have been any of us, but I was the one who wanted to go riding on my bike alone that day instead of playing video games with my two brothers. My sister had decided to run home when none of the other guys seemed to try to go against him. In fact, they were egging him on, telling him that, yeah, he should kill some of the kids. She had been running home to warn us and got just enough of a head start before the boys hopped into their truck. The cops were called, but apparently the boys denied it all, and their parents all lied and claimed that they had never even left their trailer, so nothing ever came of it. I knew two of the boys' names because we lived in the same neighborhood in a small town, and I know they never got any less evil with age. Not long after that, these same boys invited my sister to a bonfire party that, quote, everyone was going to be at, unquote. But my sister decided not to go. When she asked all of her friends the next day how the party was, literally no one knew about any party. That's because she was the only one invited. Who knows what they may have had planned for her that day had she gone. She stayed away from them after that, and fortunately, neither of us still lives in that town. One of the two boys that I knew in the truck is currently incarcerated on several drug-related charges, but the other one is still out there. As far as the other three that were in the truck, I have no idea who or where they are or what they're up to. So, to the piece of garbage boys in that truck, you can keep my bike because I hope we never meet again. This happened when I was visiting some family members in Florida. We were all having dinner one night, and my uncle started telling stories from his youth. He mentioned going to Casadaga with his friends a couple of times, and immediately the rest of the family started chiming in with their own Casadaga stories. Not being a Florida native, I asked them what Casadaga was. My uncle told me it's a small town a little over an hour away from his place, and that it had a reputation for being the psychic capital of the world. He said he and his friends would go there in high school because it was also rumored to be haunted. Being a lover of all things creepy and paranormal, I immediately wanted to go and see what all the fuss was about. My uncle, being up for anything, agreed to take me. Mind you, it was after 9.30 p.m. and the place was still over an hour's drive away. Yet, my uncle, two other family members, and I got into the truck and started driving there. After over an hour of driving, we hit Casadega, got off the freeway, and turned down a narrow gravel road. There were absolutely no lights on this road. Now, this happened during the summer of 2016, when that whole clown craze thing was going on. So when we found ourselves in complete darkness in the middle of nowhere, all I could think of was that some freak in a clown costume was going to jump out and scare us. We passed a lot of houses while driving, none of which had any lights on. Granted, it was past 11 p.m. at this point, but I found it hard to believe that no one had any lights on in their houses. It definitely added to the eerie atmosphere. We finally pulled into a local hotel without any clown interference to my delight. For clarification, we weren't planning on staying at the hotel. My uncle just wanted to show me around the town and maybe talk to the locals a bit, and the hotel was the only building with any lights on. We parked in the tiny parking lot in front of the entrance and got out of the car. I'm not sure what compelled us to do so, but we all left our respective doors wide open. We walked up to the hotel and started to go inside. The lights were on, but there was nobody in there. 
I found this odd because we were potential customers and I was expecting someone to come out to greet us. As we were all standing by the entrance, a silver car pulled up into the parking lot. It slowed down in front of us and a man stuck his head out the window and said, you're gonna regret this, and drove off. Not a single word was exchanged between my family members and I, but within a split second, we had all booked it back to the car. My uncle started driving us back to the highway so that we could get out of there and get home fast. At that point, I was already freaked out. So when a black SUV with garbage bags taped over the windows started tailing us and trying to bump our car from behind, I legitimately started to pray. It was the middle of the night and there were no lights on the small roads we were driving on. And now some madman was trying to run us off the road. Every time my uncle would speed up in order to get away from this guy, the guy in the black SUV would speed up too. We were driving at such an incredible speed, it only took us a couple of minutes to get to the road that connected us to the highway. With the SUV still tailing us, halfway down the road, I noticed a familiar car parked on the side of the road by the ditch. It was that same silver car from the hotel parking lot. The driver was pulling something out of the trunk as we were approaching it. Because of the speed we were going at, I couldn't clearly see what it was. Although I couldn't see what was in the trunk, I didn't have a good feeling about it. When we finally got to the end of the road, my uncle was so desperate to get out of there that he ran a red light and turned onto the highway. The black SUV didn't follow us onto the highway. We never really talked about what happened that night, and I had basically forgotten about it up until today. I was driving a rental car at 3 a.m., just my friend Theo and I heading home from a long road trip. We were driving on a dark two-lane road that twisted through the mountains. We wanted to make it back before dawn, but a few hours from home, exhaustion hit us. Bleary-eyed and desperate to stay awake, we looked ahead for someplace that we could stop, anywhere with lights. There was almost no signal on our phones to search for options, so we were very relieved to see a gas station through the trees up ahead. It had been the only building, or lights for that matter, that we'd seen for miles. As I drove towards it, I saw a blur, and I realized I had just passed someone, a man walking on the side of the road, just at the edge of the woods. It was a brief glimpse, but I saw that he was carrying something long, resting on his shoulder. We'd both seen it. Weird, but we weren't concerned. I guess we were just too exhausted to care. And then we were both very frustrated when the gas station turned out to be a medical clinic, long ago converted from a gas station. They'd kept the typical awning above where the gas pumps would be, and the lights were on outside, but the office was dark. We eased down the narrow gravel driveway and paused in front of the building anyway, trying to get enough signal on our phones to look up a motel or at least somewhere safe to nap. The signal was still spotty, so we turned the car off to save gas and resorted to paper maps to try to find a hotel. Neither one of us felt great about this spot even though it was a little island of light in the darkness. This was when the man showed up in my rearview mirror, continuing to walk along the road, keeping just at the edge of the pool of light. I had an immediate bad feeling and started the engine. No lights, just the engine. I didn't want to blind some poor guy trying to get somewhere if that was all he was doing. As he passed us by, I saw his back, and I realized he was carrying a flag on his shoulder, wrapped with a cord. I couldn't quite make out the type of flag, hard to tell in the dark, and with it being curled up. His clothing looked odd, too, like something you'd see at a military surplus store, but I'd seen odd clothing on drifters before. 
He just passed us and kept walking into the dark, out of the light and out of sight. I told myself he was just a local, walking home from some hole-in-the-wall bar, or a homeless guy heading to the next town. I told myself it was the exhaustion getting to me, making me paranoid. We looked at the map for quite some time, cursing our bad signal, and finally, we figured out a route to get us to the nearest large town where we would find a hotel or at least a safe parking lot to nap in. We got ready to go, and I told Theo that he could put his seat back and nap. I had gotten my second wind and I could drive it by myself. Theo sighed with relief and put his seat back. I was pretty sure he fell asleep in a second. I tried my phone once again, watched the signal flicker in and out, and checked the map one last time. Finally ready to go, I turned on my high beams to check the narrow driveway that led out of the parking lot, and my adrenaline shot up. That man hadn't walked on. He'd stood there in the dark that whole time, and now the headlights hit him. He was facing us, dark clothes, dark military-style boots, dark complexion, and a huge smile. That smile raised the hair on the back of my neck. It seemed all sorts of off to me. He was staring at the car, just grinning, and he was blocking the narrow road in front of us that led to the way out. I waited. I figured if this guy wanted to mess with me, he'd have to come closer. I checked behind me, gauging if I could quickly back up, but it had been a weird place to turn in in the first place, and a gravel road. Plus, there were several concrete poles to move between. It would not be a speedy path in reverse. And I didn't know the car well, and I wasn't confident that I could reverse it without getting into an accident. I glanced at my sleeping friend. Then, suddenly, the guy was right in front of our car. I'm still not sure how he could have done that. In what was only a second that I looked away, how was he suddenly just there, with that weird grin on his face? I must have made some kind of noise, because Theo woke up and sat bolt upright. What the hell? He said, as the guy just stared at us, grinning in the headlights, standing right in front of the car, just grinning. Some crazy guy, I whispered. Now, we'd both lived in big cities, and we'd dealt with crazy before. If they're not armed, usually there's nothing to worry about. I saw no weapon, but I was wary. Wary, but not scared. Then, I noticed the heavy-looking point at the end of the flagpole, still resting on his shoulder. I had a very vivid mental image of him spearing it into the windshield, or just down into the hood of the car. I had no idea what was going on, but I did not want to give this crazy, middle-of-the-night guy a reason to attack the car. And I knew I couldn't reverse quickly enough to get us out of there. So I waited, mentally willing this grinning nutcase to walk on and away from us. I have no idea how long he stood there, just staring at us, grinning. After a while, he began moving, sliding against the car, slowly coming around to my side, dragging himself against the car as he moved. The car shifted slightly with his weight, and I could hear the drag of the wooden flagpole on the side of the car. A small, ridiculous part of my brain congratulated myself on buying insurance for the rental car, sure that he was scratching it. This grinning crazy then gripped the driver's side mirror, as if using it for support, and leaned down. I saw that grin through my window and looked away. I suddenly did not want to look at that freakish smile that was now only inches away from my face, with only a thin pane of glass between us. Theo leaned over slightly, looking through my window. I saw my friend shake his head. No, he said firmly. No. I saw the grinning man make a rude hand gesture at Theo, and Theo said louder, more forcefully, No. The man straightened up, no longer leaning on the car. 
I saw his fist grip the flagpole, and I gunned it out of there. He just stood there in that pool of light as I shot out of the parking lot and onto the dark road. No longer sleepy at all. We had no problem staying awake as we drove to the next town, where we then found a motel. So crazy flag-carrying man, let's not ever meet again. A few nights ago this happened to me, and I keep thinking about it. Now, I work in the criminal justice field, and I see a lot of crime, and I'm also a follower of scary movies and scary stories in general, so I have a heightened sense of paranoia sometimes. But my girlfriend and her roommate both agree, this was weird. I was walking my girlfriend's roommate's dog at night, and their neighborhood is a very safe suburb of New York. I walked across the parking lot and onto this little field in the middle of a roundabout. I was screwing around on my phone, and it was nearly midnight and in the middle of a quarantine, so there were no cars out. The dog had a long leash, so she was sniffing around, and then I saw her stop and stare towards the road. I looked up, and I saw a black SUV stopped in the roundabout. I had my COVID mask half off, but when I saw them, I put it back up. Some people in New York are touchy about that type of thing, understandably so. So just in case they were stopping to lecture me, I didn't want to engage in an argument, and I put my mask back on. I turned my attention back to my phone, and then I looked back up, and the SUV was still there. There was a family, a mother and father in front, and their 12-year-old looking daughter in the back. It was rather jarring because they were all just blankly staring directly at me. I sort of waved and nodded and started walking the dog around the grass again. And then they started to slowly circle the roundabout and I looked back and all of them were again staring directly at me as they moved. I figured maybe they wanted to talk to me so I stopped and waited for them to get around the circle. But when they approached, they just kept driving very slowly, all staring directly at me still. I gave another half wave and they drove past me, still slowly and still staring. Then once again, they drove around the circle, literally all of them blankly staring at me this entire time, even the little girl in the back seat. I made a shrugging gesture as if to say, what the F? They did this a couple more times and I started to walk up to the edge of the circle to engage with them. Not normally something I would do, but this was a family, so I sort of felt a bit braver to do so. They sped up a bit and went around the corner and turned off of the roundabout. It started to feel even weirder, so I decided to walk back to my girlfriend's apartment building when they entered the roundabout yet again. I was watching them out of the corner of my eye, and they were still staring. I picked up the pace, and they turned off the roundabout and drove towards me and followed. Once I got to the sidewalk, I turned around because I didn't want them to know which door I was going into. It's a strip mall that had other apartment buildings and stores and they stopped about 30 feet behind me, all still staring out the front window, and the little girl, now sitting front seat center, staring. I once again shrugged my shoulders and raised my arms up as if to say, uh, can I help you? And I received no response at all from them, only more blank stares. I took my phone out and typed their license plate number into my phone app, not really knowing what I would do with the information. Then they slowly drove to the other side of the parking lot, all still staring. Once they reached the other end of the lot, I rushed into the apartment building, which luckily needs a code to enter. I went in and told my girlfriend and her roommate about what happened, and they both kind of freaked out. 
I watched them out the window, and they pulled the car up to where I had been standing on the sidewalk and just sat there in the car. I couldn't see them at that point, only the roof of their car. After maybe ten minutes, they slowly drove away. I can't stop thinking about their creepy-ass blank stares. Somehow it made it all the creepier because they were just this normal-looking family with a young daughter. If it had been two young guys, I could have written it off that they were bored and were messing with me. But it was just blank, unmoving, expressionless stares from a normal-looking family of three. It made it so much creepier. So, to the weird family in the black SUV, let's not ever meet again, even though I'm dying for an explanation. Around 16 years ago, my significant other and I were driving between Denver and San Diego. We found ourselves on a fairly empty stretch of highway in New Mexico. It was late, probably one or two in the morning, and we noticed a police roadblock up ahead. Thinking it was just some sort of accident, we didn't pay too much mind and simply came to a stop. There were two cars in front of us and one behind, all stopped and the officer directing traffic sent us all off the highway onto a small dirt road that ran alongside a field. It had some sort of crop, maybe corn, if I remember right. The road was level, no hills, and we continued down the road for about 10 minutes. The other cars were maybe two car lengths from us, not too far, not too close. Then, all of a sudden, they were gone. No flash, no sound, they simply weren't there anymore. We thought, well, that's odd, but we figured maybe we just missed a turn somewhere or something. We kept going for another 10 minutes with no turn in sight, and it started to creep us out. The road just kept going further and further into what appeared to be empty wilderness. Freaked out by this, we decided to head back and ask the police officer if we missed a turn somewhere. We carefully looked for turns on our way back, but there were none, and we didn't come across any other car the whole way back. When we got back to the highway, the police were gone. The entire roadblock was gone. No more cones or flares. No more police tape. It was all just gone. How could everything disappear in less than 20 minutes with no sign that it ever existed to begin with? We got back on that highway and drove back to California as fast as possible. To this day, I still don't know if we just missed a turn or what, but it was extremely unsettling, to say the least. I was driving down the highway at 3 in the morning and my exit was coming up. My lane and another driver's lane merged into one. I needed to get into his lane to cross over to the exit ramp and he needed to get into my lane to get on to the highway. If one of us didn't slow down or change lanes, we would have collided. I looked at him. He looked at me. He wasn't going to yield, so I honked and accelerated to pass him and got off at my exit. The moment I passed him, I felt an overwhelming sense of dread. It was sudden and without any context, but my gut feeling has gotten me out of dangerous situations in the past, and I trust it more than I trust anyone or anything in my life, and I'm glad I listened to it that night. I checked my rearview mirror and I saw that the man that I had cut off was now behind me. This meant that he had ditched his original direction to get on the highway and backtracked just to follow me. I didn't know that being followed by people in their car was a thing, so I thought maybe I was just being paranoid. I drove to my neighborhood and to my apartment building, but I did have the sense not to stop at my apartment, just in case. 
I didn't want him to know where I lived, so I took four right turns trying to lose him. But he was on my tail the whole time. When I sped up, he sped up. When I turned, he turned. I realized then that I was being followed. I couldn't believe it, so I drove around the block again. I started driving erratically, trying to lose him, but he matched my speed every time. My panicked driving must have indicated to him that I knew that he was following me. And I get so angry when I think back to how he must have been laughing to himself, knowing that I was terrified. Also, I was so stupid. I kept following the traffic laws, and I actually stopped at empty intersections, and I even put my turn signal on. I can't believe it myself, but I had never been in that situation before. Finally, I drove to a nearby police station that was actually closed, but the guy didn't know that, and he drove off. I parked in front of my apartment building, but stayed in the car for a good 45 minutes, shaking and checking to see if he came back. My phone was dead, so I couldn't call anyone, and the streets were empty. I ran up to my apartment an hour later and pushed furniture against the door, afraid that he'd come looking for me. I googled driving stalkers and found countless posts of other women who had been stalked as well. Finally, I cried myself to sleep with all the lights on. If you're ever followed like this, be sure to attract as much attention as possible. Honk your horn, flash your lights, make somebody notice you. Call the police if you can. I couldn't because my phone was dead. But luckily, I knew where the police station was, and even though it was closed and basically useless, it did the trick because he didn't know it was closed. Above all though, always trust your gut instincts. I wish I had known beforehand how to handle the situation better, and I hope I never see him again. It almost makes you want to sell your car and walk everywhere, doesn't it? But then again, people would just start stalking you on foot. You can't change human nature, or the supernatural, as we saw in story number five. What was that all about anyway? If you liked these stories as much as I did, give them a thumbs up. Also, if you haven't already, subscribe and click the notification bell. But from time to time, YouTube drops the ball and fails to send out the party invitations every week when I upload my videos. So make a mental note to stop by my dark little corner of the universe every Thursday at 5 p.m. Central. I upload faithfully and never miss a week. In fact, should I die, I'll find a way to upload from the spirit world. Hey, with the subject matter we deal with on this channel, it'll be like inside reporting. Imagine the tales I can tell as a ghost myself. While you try to wrap your head around that one, until next time, stay scared, my friends.